Hello and welcome to the first actual lecture of the semester. I hope you took a minute to look at the introduction video, but if you haven't seen the introduction video, just uh, pause this and take a minute and go look at that so you have an idea of what to expect. Uh, this week there is the student introduction and the first discussion threads you have to do, and then there is also a quiz you have to do as well. Uh, for today, I'm going to talk about prehistory, and I'm going to ease you in. This is going to be a fairly short lecture. I'm sure you're happy about that. And I'm going to start with our earliest ancestors. Now, it's really important to know that a lot of our early history, it's speculative. We don't know for sure that it's correct, but uh, historical modeling, anthropological modeling, and biological modeling kind of points that this is the direction things went. Um, it looks like our earliest ancestors uh, appeared on the savannas, the grasslands, if you will, of eastern and southern Africa, somewhere around four million years ago. And according to the fossil record, the our earliest ancestors are going to stay there until about one and a half million years ago. Now, they're limited to where they can live because of the climate. Uh, they can't move where it's too hot. They can't move where it's too cold. Uh, fire is going to be the big change because fire is going to allow our earliest ancestors to move to places that are colder. Now, our direct ancestors are called Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens appeared somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago. And the period they live in is called the Paleolithic. Paleo means stone, lithic, age, Paleolithic, old stone, age. Now, our earliest ancestors, they lived in groups that were known as hunting and gathering groups. Uh, they have to find all the food that they eat. Uh, there is no agriculture, there is no growing gardens, nothing like that. Because all of the food has to be gathered, the largest hunter-gathering groups you're going to find at this time estimated to be about 20 to 50 people. Now the food gathering is a job for everyone, as it says here. Uh, the men are going to be hunting animals and providing the large meats. Women are going to be gathering roots, berries, seeds, fruits, the smaller stuff to catch. Another big part of these Homo sapien hunter-gathering groups is the kinship groups. And the kinships are really, really important because it gave everybody a role. Everybody knew <clears throat> what their position was in the group. Everybody knew how to contribute, what they needed to contribute, and they shared knowledge. Uh, for some people today, if you were to go out in the woods and, be t and ask, you know, what should I eat? What can I not eat? We wouldn't really know because we go to the grocery store. These kinship groups, however, uh, they knew exactly which plants to eat, which plants to use for medicine, uh, they knew which animal life was the easiest to get and eat with the least caloric deficit, if you will. So basically, they knew which plants, which animals were good for them and which plants and animals were bad for them. Some other really important things are the traditions established by the kinship groups or the rules established by the kinship groups. Uh, basically... These kinship groups, they established the, the rules, the regulations, what people are supposed to do. And it provided a sense of security. So it was kind of conforming, but it's also restrictive as well. Uh, think about when you lived with your parents. Some of you may still live with your parents. You know, sometimes that can be a little constrictive, but you always know where you can go to be safe. You have to also look at Neanderthals. Uh, Neanderthals are closely related to Homo sapiens. And most of our fossil record for Neanderthals comes from southern Europe and parts of Western Asia. 
And they're called Neanderthals because they were discovered in the Neanderthal Valley of Germany. <clears throat> Very similar to, to uh, Homo sapiens. They were skilled hunters. They could use tools. They could create tools. There's evidence of a form of language. There's evidence of burial rituals. They honored their dead. They honored their deceased. They buried the deceased. Burial sites have been found with like flowers and and um, jewelry and everything else. So we know that Neanderthals were advanced. DNA studies show that somewhere between one and three percent of the DNA of people of non-African descent is made up of Neanderthal DNA. That means that there was some intermixing, there was some cross-breeding, uh, but we're not 100% sure what happened to Neanderthals. There's two real big competing theories right now in the anthropology um, circles. One of the, the theories is that Climate change caused too much pressure on the Neanderthal populations and the Neanderthals could not keep up and they could not adapt. There's also the idea that Neanderthals were either outcompeted by Homo sapiens or joined in Homo sapien communities. But the fossil record on Neanderthals is still being uncovered as we speak. Now you might ask about agriculture, and agriculture is actually a fairly recent creation. The first agriculture appears somewhere between nine and 10,000 years ago, depending on what part of the world. And this is when the Neolithic happens. Neo means new, lithic means stone, new stone age or Neolithic. So Paleolithic is the old stone age, Neolithic New Stone Age. Now, agriculture, like I said, it's fairly new. And there are a couple different reasons. There are a couple things that change where people can no longer gather all the food they need. One of the big things is the average amount of wild food available declines. Humans are very efficient hunters, and we ate or we killed a lot of different things. Still do today, actually. As knowledge of the world around them grew, they realized that there were certain plants and certain animals that they could domesticate, they could grow, uh, they could... Sh um, put in the fields, etc., etc. Then you also have new technologies. Now you may not think of a bowl as a new technology, but it was. It was a way to store food. Clay bowls, you can store food. Uh, cooking pots, that's a technology to unlock the potential energy in foods. You could even take a mortar and pestle where you can you know, crunch up and crack open nuts and grains, which allows you to access the nutrients inside. With more food comes more people. And with more people, there's the need for more food. And it becomes this repeating cycle that goes over and over and over and over again. So eventually, there's just not enough food to go around and they have to start growing food or they're going to starve. Now, it would take on average somewhere between 20 and 50 square miles per day of food gathering to support these groups. So eventually you can see the, the food is going to run out fairly quickly as the human populations grow. Now, animal domestication begins in Western Asia. Think Mesopotamia, <clears throat> modern day Iraq, modern day Iran. Your first animals are going to be sheep, then goats and then pigs as well. <clears throat> Before you know it, around 6,000 BC, agriculture can be found all throughout Western Asia. Animal domestication can be found all throughout West, Western Asia. And that is, once again, 
Mesopotamia, Iran, Iraq, those parts of the world. Now, as agriculture grows, people start to sit down, <clears throat> they quit moving as much, and they become more sedentary. And you're going to get your first villages somewhere around 6,500 to 3,500 BC, depending on where in Western Asia you are. 100% related to agriculture, because without agriculture, there wouldn't be enough food to support all these people living in one place. Now, with a village comes the idea of an artisan or a craftsperson, or to make it simple, a person who makes stuff. So you end up with adults who specialize in pottery, specialize in weaving, specialize in tool making, specialize in weapon making as well. Now, this is important because the pots allow for the transportation of food. Clothing means that you're protected from the elements, from the hot, from the cold. Tools make hunting more efficient. Tools make farming easier. And tools and weapons even can protect you from others. Uh, originally, it starts with flint tools. And then by around 5000 BC, we have moved on to copper tools. So tool making develops relatively quickly. You also have long distance trade. Uh, there's evidence of trade as early as 6,000 BC. And how it works basically is one community has too many goats, another community maybe has too many chickens, and they learn we can just trade with each other and we can both benefit. But this long distance trade also gives rise to the idea of warfare because I mean, why would you trade? Why would you give up something of your own if you could just take somebody else's by force? So the birth of warfare really happens when these villages develop as well. Eventually, these villages are going to grow and you get the idea of a city. A city is going to be a larger, more developed village. Uh, evidence of the first cities is around 3500 BC. And the cities, they've got the, the farmers, they've got the agriculture, they've got the artisans who make stuff, and they also have merchants, people who buy and sell stuff. And then for the first time uh, in the city, you get this idea of the full-time administrator. Uh, so you have full-time warriors to protect you, you have full-time people running the city, and then you have full-time priests also. They kind of fall into this administrator class. Now, more often than not, these warriors, these administrators, they don't really produce anything, but they are credited with protecting the city. Now, with the city life, you also have the development of irrigation. There's the taming of water to move it into these cities so that these cities can continue to produce more and more food. And... The first rivers to really be tamed, the first rivers to really be irrigated is the Tigris River and the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. The Tigris and Euphrates, they run through modern day Iraq and parts of Syria as well and a little bit of Jordan. Now, when the water is tamed, when agriculture begins, food production in these areas explodes. And as I said earlier, with more food comes more people, when more, with more people comes more food, so it becomes this recurring cycle, if you will. Eventually, when you get a couple of different cities near each other, this idea of civilization begins. I'm gonna talk about more of this next time when I go over Mesopotamia, but civilization is really going to be the birth of what develops into our modern world. Now, the first evidence of civilization begins around 3000 BC in what is today modern day Iraq. And it was a place that we call today Sumer. It was located where the Euphrates River, the Tigris River, and the Arabian Sea all come together. We know that there were three classes of people. There were nobles and priests, there were commoners, and there were slaves. 
We have some evidence of their laws, so we know that each of these three classes was treated a little bit differently. They had different rights, they had different privileges, and they had different roles or duties, if you will. Different civilizations traded with each other. Just like the villages traded and the cities traded, the civilizations traded as well. So they would trade food, they would trade wood and stone, they would trade different precious metals. And Sumerians are really the first ones to do the irrigation. And they developed some of the earliest math systems. Their math systems were based on the number 60. Um, it has a couple advantages. There's the numbers 3, 10, and 12. Um, that lives on today, 12 inches in a foot, 3 feet in a yard, 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour. Uh, you can even see this idea in the circle because there's 360 degrees in a circle. All of those are factors or, or numbers that involve 60. Sumerians invent the first writing system. It's known as cuneiform. Uh, cuneiform is really interesting because it's a pictographic system. And what that means is the different pictures stand for different things. Sometimes the picture they drew could be an idea. Sometimes the picture they drew could be an actual object. Or sometimes the picture they drew could stand for a sound. So even though it's just pictures, it's actually pretty complicated. And if you go to a larger school like Emory, UGA, something like that, if you choose to do a four-year degree, cuneiform is actually something you can study in a good amount of cuneiform has been translated into modern day languages. Another important thing that the Sumerians develop is the idea of organized religion. Uh, the Sumerians, they had a religion that helped them to explain nature and their part in nature, their part in the world. Uh, Sumerians, they believed that there were gods that played an active part in their life. The Sumerian gods were responsible for their food, for rain, for drought. And they even had one particular god named Enlil, E-N-L-I-L, -L, who was in charge of carrying out all the punishments. And they had to um, keep Enlil happy to make sure it didn't rain too much or too little. So, as promised, pretty short. Uh, but that will give you a good idea of where we came from, where civilization gets its start, and where humanity gets its start. Now, it is the it is 3 p.m. that this is going to go up on the 12th. If you will send me a message in Blackboard sometime in the next 48 hours. So this is an offer available from 3 p.m. on January 12th to 3 p.m. on January 14th. If you send me an email saying that you watched this entire thing, I'll add 10 points to your quiz for this week. It's not much, but it is a little bonus as a thank you for being involved in the class. Until next time, I hope you enjoy this, and we will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.